welcome you here tonight. Yes, I'm so excited that you're so excited. <laughs> welcome to our fourth year of Science in the Club, brought to you by the New England Northwest Regional Science Hub uh, and funded and supported by Inspiring Australia. And for the last few years, also the Armadale Club until it disappeared and now, very gratefully, the Wicklow Hotel. The third year brought a lot of sort of different talks and we've tried to keep science in the club as diverse as we possibly can. We've gone from the power of plants to quantum mechanics. We've covered STEM education and national curriculum agendas in Australia. Also food security, climate change, genetics, CRISPR and you name it and um, a lot of other things as well. So this year we're kicking off, we thought, on Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody, by the way. With something quite relevant to Valentine's Day and relevant to everybody because everybody has a brain. <laughs> I think, is that, is that correct? Is that, is, is that just an assumption of mine? <laughs> so tonight we bring to you sex, love and neurobiology, courtesy of St Valentine's. And the night will go something like this, very similar to the structure of the last um, many, 20-odd. We have sp two speakers for you tonight, and they're going to present to you an introduction of the most complex phenomena in the known universe. It's cool if you don't get it. It's complex. And we're also going to delve deeper into what that phenomena means for our daily lives, and sometimes particularly for love and for women. We are going to do that for about the first hour. Then we usually have a bit of a break. We have more finger food out. And if you haven't eaten anything, there's finger food up the back there on the table. We then do trivia with trivia master Dr. James O'Hanlon. Wave your hand, James. So please keep your eyes and ears out for particularly complex information through the talks because there could be something in trivia. You do it in teams. Usually it's just the prestige of actually winning trivia and knowing that you're like really cool at science in the club. But tonight... <laughs> Courtesy of Dr. Sarah Mackay, we have the Women's Brain Book. And you don't actually have to win it at Trivia to own it because Sarah is here tonight selling the book. It's out the front. If you haven't bought it already, it'll be available during the break and also at the end. But if you really try hard at Trivia, you may get a copy of that to fight over in your, um, in your team as well. So that's the Trivia Prize. You, may, you should have also received a raffle ticket as you came up the stairs. Did anyone not receive a raffle ticket? Okay. <laughs> Siobhan has raffle tickets. Siobhan, I think there's one over here, the lady in the red, and up the back there. Okay, great. Because we have a lucky door prize each event as well, and that's for a one-year subscription to Cosmos magazine, um, which has been, you know, really well received each year as well, and we'll continue doing that this year. Oh, Suze, you've got raffle tickets. Awesome. <laughs> So we wrap, usually wrap up trivia and then we have a QA and a panel. So again, if you've got any burning questions for our speakers tonight, please keep them in mind, write them down and you'll have an opportunity for banter, for questions um, and to drill into more of what they know. So I'd really like to introduce our speakers tonight. We often pair a local scientist with a guest speaker and tonight we're lucky to have both. Dr. Adam Hamlin is a neuroscientist from UNE but he's come a circuitous route through University of Sydney, University of New South Wales, the Queensland Brain Institute, Charles Sturt University, and now here. He, at the moment, works on a lot of behavioural and neuroscience work, um, and also in the past has looked at mechanisms for Alzheimer's disease and diseases in general. Adam's going to start off by introducing the brain and tell us a bit about his research and UNE neuroscientist research. And our guest speaker tonight is a very well-known neuroscientist who's taken her love of in-depth science and turned it into a career in communicating complex scientific um, information about neurobiology. Dr Sarah Mackay is with us tonight from Sydney. She actually runs Your Brain Health Online and the Neuroscience Academy. She has spoken, written um, and danced. Have you ever danced neurobiology, Sarah? Yeah, I'm sure she has about neuroscience all over the world. She's a graduate of Oxford University and tonight she's going to talk sex, love and neurobiology and touch on a little bit of stuff from her women's brain book too. Also, she's got a really good um, bank of brain jokes. 
So could you please bring them out? And I don't know, you might want to bring them out too. So without further ado, no more babbling from me. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Adam Hamlin to introduce the brain and kick off the first science in the club. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Kirsty. You're so bubbly. You got my talk there, Michael? Awesome. So what I'd like to do tonight is just, um, I've only got 15, 20 minutes to tell you about the most complex phenomena in the known universe. So we're just going to take a little tour through the nervous system and then I'm going to just talk a little bit about what we're doing at UNE in neuroscience research. Um, so here it is. And I don't like to talk about the brain because it's not just the brain, it's the nervous system. We talk about the nervous system, it's everything interconnected. So here it is, this is the dissection of the full human nervous system. So when we think about the nervous system, we talk about the brain, but what does the brain need? The brain needs information. So we have these sensory systems. So it's always gathering information from our sensory systems. That could be from our external environment, which we're all very familiar with, hearing, sight, etc. But also a full internal milieu as well. So how many sensory systems do you think we have? What's the, what do we usually say? We've got the five senses. Okay, that goes right back to Aristotle. Okay, he came up with the five senses. He didn't even think pain was a sensation. He thought you had the five senses and then things were either painful or they weren't or they were pleasurable. We actually have somewhere between 50 and 60 different sensory systems coming in. We've got the ones we're familiar with because they reach our cortex and we become aware of them. But we've got all these other ones too. Chemoreceptors, okay, measuring the carbon dioxide levels in our blood, our baroreceptors monitoring the blood pressure, all of these sensory systems coming in. Then it comes into our favourite bits, the brain, spinal cord where it gets integrated. Okay, we need to know something about it. We process that information. What are we going to do with that information? Okay, so the brain does some process, but then we need to respond to that information. And we respond via three different nervous system, um, peripheral nervous system systems. Motor systems, where we can move a muscle. We're in control of that. Okay, so we move our muscles. Comes from up here. But we also have autonomic nervous systems. Okay, and we have two of those. The sympathetic nervous system, okay, which commonly called our four Fs, okay, or a fight, flight, freeze, or when two people love each other very much. And we'll get into that later. And our parasympathetic nervous system, our rest and digest. Okay, so that's really what it's doing. Bringing information in, processing it, and then responding via our motor systems. How does it do that? It does that through around 150 to 180,000 kilometres of wires. Okay, so incredibly extensive. And around 100 billion neurons or nerve cells. Okay, so here they are. These are the nerve cells. These are the rock stars of the nervous system. There's lots of other cells, but we won't worry about them tonight. Let's just talk about the rock stars, their neurons. So they are communicating with, with each other electrically. Okay, so they can be very short, very long. But the electrical signals travel along these neurons up to 120 metres per second. Okay, that's pretty quick. That's like Formula One type speeds. So I just think Daniel Ricciardo going through Eau Rouge at Spa Frank and Chops. Okay, that's really quick. And they do this, okay, by simply moving sodium and potassium across a five nanometer piece of fat. Okay, so everything you do, okay, all your fears, your loves, everything you see, everything you hear, simply requires the movement of a sodium and a potassium across the plasma membrane. Okay, so electrical signaling traveling at up to 120 meters per second. So they're the rock stars. Just think everything we do. They're a complex cell. They've got like most cells, all of our cellular machinery. Okay, but they've got a few special features. Whoops. We've got our dendrites that receive all the information. Okay, these can be our sensory endings when we touch something. It's a sensory information or information from other neurons. Then they've got this really whoops, long process here called the axon. These can be incredibly long. So you've got one axon in your spinal cord, or one cell in your spinal cord, that's moving your big toe. We'll have a look at that in a minute. So these cells can be about one metre long. Okay, and this is where the electrical signal travels along at 120 metres per second. 
But this is where the nervous system gets really complicated, at the level of the synapse. So every single one of those 100 billion neurons that make up your nervous system is being communicated to by somewhere between 1,000 to 10,000 other neurons via this connection here called the synapse. Okay. Now, the thing, another thing about these 100 billion neurons is they don't actually touch each other ever. There's a small gap between all of them. And this is, this synapse, this is where we convert that really fast travelling electrical signal with that sodium and potassium moving through that thin layer of fat into a chemical signal. And it releases chemicals. Okay? And these chemicals then stimulate the next neuron and pass that information along. So this is how all that data or information has been transferred throughout your nervous system at the level of the synapse. And we use some of these... You may have heard of some of these neurotransmitters. These are the chemicals. Things like dopamine and noradrenaline, serotonin, etc., acetylcholine. Every time you move a muscle, acetylcholine is being released onto your muscle. Okay. So this is where we get the complexity. And we think there's around 60 trillion of these connections in the nervous system. And this is where you learn. Every time you learn something, it's the level of these tiny little connections at the level of the synapse. Okay? So every time you learn something, there's a physical change in that synapse. It's called plasticity. And I'm sure Sarah might talk about plasticity later as well. So we can see this even within... Oh, I'll just push that button. Sorry, I leant on it. Even within an hour. So here's our neuron, our dendrites, and all these little spikes here. We call them spines. These are our dendrites. Okay, and if we stimulate one, okay, with some electrically, like we can stimulate them electrically, we can see that even over an hour we're getting this physical change here at the level of the synapse. That's plasticity, that's learning. So that's where it's happening. So I'm just going to ask you now to wiggle the big toe on your right foot. Easy? Anyone have any trouble doing that? Let's take a little walk through the nervous system and see how you did that. Okay, we'll just look at how complex it is. First of all, some sound waves. Okay, these are just simple sound waves. They were gathered by your ear. They went down your external auditory canal where they hit a little membrane called the tympanic membrane which vibrated in response to that. Then it went into the inner ear. Three little bones called the ossicles. They articulated, they amplified, and they pushed on another little membrane called the oval window. This caused pressure waves in fluid in your inner ear, the cochlea. In the cochlea, there's another little membrane that vibrated in response to that. And these vibrations caused little hair cells in your cochlea to move. And the movement of these hair cells allowed an ion called potassium to come in and cause an electrical response. Okay, in the nerve, in the cochlear nerve. That information then travelled down the cochlear nerve into the cochlear nucleus in your brainstem. Then from there, went up a little bit further into the olivary nucleus. Here, this is where you determined where that sound came from. We're very good, even close your eyes. Just think about where a sound comes from. Instantly we know exactly where a sound comes from. So right down here. Then it goes up to another area called the medial geniculate nucleus. And finally it makes its way up into the brain, the auditory cortex. And even at this level of the auditory cortex, it was just you know, how loud it was, the pitch, the tone. It meant nothing. Then through another several different layers of processing of that information, it finally made its way to another area called Wernicke's. And it was only when this information reached Wernicke's area that we could say, oh, I know what that is. That's language. I can understand that. It means something. These sound waves now have meaning. But that meaning was, I need to do something. I need to move the big toe on my right foot. What do we do then? That information then needs to go to the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. It was a goal-directed behaviour. I have a goal. I need to hold that in my memory. From there, then it needs to go off to another area in the frontal cortex called the premotor areas, where it's thinking about how am I going to do this? 
Okay, what's the sequence of events that need to occur? Then it does another little loop through what's known as the basal ganglia. Okay, before it goes back there. And this is all about the initiation of the action. This is where we get Parkinson's disease in the basal ganglia. You know, with Parkinson's, they can't initiate the movement. Damage to the basal ganglia. After it's gone through here, it needs to go down through the cerebellum at the back of the brain. Because in order to move a muscle, the first thing you need to know is where the hell am I in space? You need to know exactly where you are and to be able to move the muscle properly. Then it will finally go up to the motor cortex, okay, which will then drive the spinal cord. And the spinal cord will finally drive the muscles. I'm not used to I usually have a lapel mic. So I have two hands. But um, yeah, so that's our little tool. And it's the same as sex, okay, the act of mating. <laughs> it's just the nervous system that controls it. Okay, so let's take a little tour for the act of mating. And I'm not even going to get into any of the other stuff. Okay, so we talk about, in neuroscience, we talk about the sexual response cycle. Arousal. Comes from the brain. That's I'm horny. Okay, that's coming up from the brain. I feel horny. Or it can be through direct stimulation of the genitals via our sensory systems, bringing that information in to the spinal cord. And when it reaches the spinal cord, we then trigger the parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is all about this arousal now. Okay, the engorgement of the clitoris, the labia, and the penis with blood. Okay, so that's what its role is. Then the plateau. Plateau, as we all know, can last various amounts of time. Okay, and that's all about now the release of lubricating fluids. Okay, from our bulb, your urethral glands, etc., and the vagina, we get the release of the fluids. Okay, makes things go together nicely. Okay, and that plateau will continue to various amounts of time. Stimulation will increase. And then, as the stimulation increases, we may get to orgasm, and this is where we need to switch nervous systems. Okay, we've got to switch now from our parasympathetic nervous system to our sympathetic nervous system, which controls the orgasm, okay, the muscular contractions of the vagina and the ejaculation is all controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. And then we go into resolution. And for males, probably takes around half an hour, I guess they give us a break, before we can get back to the beginning of the cycle and start all over again. It's controlled by the nervous system, okay? So that's the sexual response cycle. And... Uh, of course, orgasm lights up many areas of the brain, okay? As you'd expect, somatosensory areas of the brain because it's very um, somatosensory, very body sensation, but also deep brain structures, okay? Dopaminergic systems, which, are all, which has been misnamed the reward system. It's not the reward system at all. It controls our goal-directed behaviours, so it stimulates dopamine. And we also get a huge release of endogenous opioids, a huge release of endogenous opioids. Um, so it's anti-stress, analgesic. Okay, and this is a little picture here I took a few years back of enkephalin being released around um, stress hormone-releasing neurons in an area of the brain that's called the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis. Okay, it controls our stress responses. And arousal. Who knows what arousal is? Let's not get into the brain and all of those things. Last attraction... Arousal, it's different for everybody. Okay, for me, it's a big pair of goth boots. Okay, but for someone else, it might be something different. Okay, so. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's it for me. Okay. That's a really quick tour of the brain. How long have I got, Kirsty? Two minutes. This is a little bit about what I do in the lab at UNE. So I'm a behavioural neuroscience, I work closely with Andrew Talk, who's also a behavioural neuroscience scientist and psychologist. We ask these type of questions. What are the brain regions? What are the neurons? What's the neurocircuitry? What's the neurochemistry that controls behaviour? Okay, so they're the sort of questions we ask. We do all these behavioural tests, usually in rodents, so we can 
do their motor effects, we can look at their cognition, we can look how stressed we, they are, we can look at their anxiety, we can look at depression, we can look at all these factors uh, in rodent models. Then we can cut up the brain and have a look what's going on in the brain and we can now start to understand what's part of the brain, what's the neurocircuitry, what are the neurons that are controlling different behaviours. At the moment, our research is, is focusing on depression, in particularly what happens in chronic early life stress. So a hugely chronic stressful event during early development has profound effects uh, on the brain, which can lead to things like PTSD, depression, anxiety, etc. So we've developed an animal model uh, to explore this. We can test their anxiety and this type of test here, cognition, sociability, so we can do all these tests in rodents. We can also look what's happening inside their brain and try and understand what's the deficits. Can we do something about it? We can look at factors such as neurogenesis, okay, the birth of new neurons. How does it affect that? We can look at, remember I said all the connections, the synapses. We can look at how complex the synapses are. Okay. So what we found so far um, is that we can get a change in the gut microbiome. So there's a whole lot of literature now and stuff about the interactions between the gut and brain axis. So stress early on affects the biome, which could then feed back to affect the neurodevelopment. So we see that with the stress. We're seeing some interesting behaviours, and it looks like risk-taking, impulsive behaviours developing in these rats. So this test is a test for anxiety. You can see that our stressed rats are um, a lot less anxious in both of these tests and they have a propensity to gamble so they're very impulsive so it's a little test where they can hit a lever a small amount of time and get a little reward or they can say okay i'm going to hit this lever a lot of times and i'm going to get the mother load okay so they're, they're very impulsive Okay, so there's some interesting things we're finding. We're seeing changes in the brain and the complexity of those, what we call the dendritic tree, the amount of branches, the amount of synapses, okay, in really interesting areas of the brain, prefrontal cortex, nucleus accumbens, which are all to do with these goal-directed behaviours. What are we going to do about it? So we've got a few experiments looking at things like sensory integration therapy, which we're giving to our rats. So this is an idea of our little sensory integration. So put the little rats in this box here every day. They've got ball pits, sand pits, lots of sensory information, high sensory input to see if we can reverse some of those behavioural and neurological deficits. Of course, we're looking at exercise. That's pretty sexy at the moment. See if that can reverse some of those changes. And of course, over in our chemistry department, okay, they're always cooking me up new drugs, which I test in uh, the rats first, okay, to see if they will... Um, do it. So that's it from me. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll see you in the uh, Q and A session. Thanks for clarifying that you test the drugs in the rats, Adam. You paused slightly there. I thought you might say take them home, <laughs> and for letting us in on some personal secrets. Thank you. Um, I love that actually in, Adam has introduced the brain uh, such that you might be able to imagine what is going on in your brain as Sarah speaks too and as you wiggle your finger and talk and when you think about the complexity of these messages that happen so quickly, um, it's mind-blowing and I kind of feel like maybe it's even a bit more complex than... Um, the quantum mechanics talk we had. I love that, that like nature and, you know, is, is far more amazing than what we can make up as humans. I'm very privileged to introduce Dr. Sarah Mackay. She has written the Women's Brain book and there's another book and I keep forgetting the title. I'm so sorry, Sarah, you're going to have to introduce it. One book, great. We've got it right here. <laughs> ah, don't want to read it right now. We'll do that. Google, yeah, Google as Sarah's up here. True. And actually, can you please put in your diaries? Tomorrow at 5.30 at PLC, Sarah is talking at the open day as well. So actually, if you want to know more, you can do tonight and tomorrow night. So I just wanted to plug that before you had to. 
little timer. Sarah's filming with Catalyst at the moment, so we feel really lucky to have her in Armidale at the moment. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Sarah Mackay. Thank you very much. Um, I've just got my phone so I can keep an eye on the time because this talk can go for, for hours. So we've got this up. So what I wanted to do is... Um, I don't want to talk about neuroscience. I don't want to talk about myself. But I want to talk to you about kind of what happened when I wrote this book. Um, and I didn't give it this title. If anyone wants to talk to me about traditional publishing, they can. You don't get to choose your own book title. I wanted to call it In Her Head, but the publishers thought that sounded a little bit too much like it would be a psychological thriller, girl on the train, <laughs> woman in the window, whatever. Um, they wanted it to say what it says on the can because, you know, that's how you sell non-fiction in Australia. So I am one of these people that never really had a book in them. I hung my lab coat up about 10 years ago after just getting really sick and tired of chasing research grants and trying to get papers published and that whole kind of academia life. Loved neuroscience, loved the lab, but got really fed up with the, the, the chase of what you had to do. Um, and since then, I've spent most of my career um, building a business around science communications. Now, I never had a book in me because I once wrote a PhD. I don't know whether anyone else has ever done that here. It's not the kind of thing that you're tempted to ever do again. And you do a PhD, that's fine. You write a book, and it's meant to be for everyone to read, not just your thesis supervisor, so it comes with a whole lot of added pressure. That said, I was approached um, kind of, what year are we now, 2019, so mid-2016, by a rather charismatic woman who became my book agent, um, who said, oh, look, let's just have a bit of a chat. Have you got any ideas about books? And I was like, well, no. I told her the PhD story. She said, well, come along, let's have a chat. And we sat down, and she asked me a really... Uh, important and interesting question. I'd, been, I'd spent an awful lot of time in, in, in the years kind of leading up to this book writing thing, um, writing all kinds of articles about brains and health and well-being and, and neuroscience. And she said, what have you ever written that has ever resonated with an audience? And I said, well, that is, that's, that's an easy answer. A, a few years ago, I wrote this article for the ABC called brain fog is a real side effect of menopause. Um, and it had, compared to any other article I have ever written, the biggest response that I'd ever had to anything I'd written. At the time of writing the article, I was kind of like 39, and when I was approached by this book author to write this book, uh, sorry, the book agent to write the book, I was 42. So I was like, I'm not writing a book on menopause. <laughs> That's something my mum once did with her friends. I don't think that that's anything I know anything about. She said, well, look, I think that there's something in that. Um, and she said, you know, just, just, just have a bit of a think about it. And so we were kind of talking about this idea of menopause, and then, which I didn't know anything about, still don't. Um, apparently soon I will. Um, <laughs> and then she said, oh, well... Um, I've always wondered, like, you're talking about brain fog and menopause. Is baby brain a real thing? And I went, baby brain? I always thought that was a load of rubbish. But I hear some people talk about it. My mother's group used to talk about it. And I had this kind of absolute light bulb moment um, that you don't get very often in life, but I definitely had one when she said that question. And it was that I had spent my entire career, you know, I started did my undergrad in neuroscience when I was 18, went off to university, did neuroscience, PhD, masters, years of research, and I had never, ever, ever before considered neuroscience through the lens of being a girl or a woman and female biology. And I realised that there were all of these questions that I didn't know the answers to. I didn't really know whether brain fog and menopause was a thing. I didn't really know whether baby brain was a thing or not. I was just kind of thinking about my own experiences. And I realised I didn't know anything about what happens to the brain during the menstrual cycle. Why a woman more likely to be depressed than men? A woman more likely to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's or not? I realised that there were just so many aspects of neurobiology I had never before considered through the lens of the female. And I thought, wow, maybe there's a book in that. And so I set out on this journey to write the book. I have just to say as a, as a caveat, 
um, I didn't choose that picture. That's an ABC picture. I call that um, the wealthy, well-worried white woman. Um, and, and I have to say, as a further caveat, that, that much of the science that is in that book, unfortunately, really is informed by the wealthy, well-worried white woman and some men. When I started thinking about all these ideas about the, you know, women's brains and stuff that happens to us, I, I, I realised that it would be nearly impossible to write a book about any aspect of things like periods and puberty and pregnancy without taking a lifespan perspective. And kind of a little bit what Adam was saying, he was talking about you know, development of depression based on early life stresses. I realised that the only way I could kind of approach a book like this was to take a look at the female lifespan, kind of a womb to tomb kind of journey through the female life and look at how life shapes our brain in a way and also how our brains shape our lives. Well, it ended up being a little bit more complicated than what I thought it was going to be initially. I thought, as I said, I was going to write a book about, you know, periods and, and puberty and pregnancy and what happens to our brains. The contract for the book came through... Uh, I can't remember the exact date. Someone here in the room might be able to tell me. Um, November 2016, the day that Trump got elected. So I was sitting with horror, watching CNN. Of course, I was watching Fox. Watching CNN, going, oh, my God, what's happening? And my agent rang and said, we've got this deal. It's great. And I said, oh, my God, thank God. I can actually, maybe I can do something. Because I was mourning Hillary's loss. And... So I thought, well, I can do something. What ended up happening was I wrote this book, which I thought was going to be about periods and puberty and pregnancy and what happens in our brains, late 2016 all the way through 2017. And that was when we kind of had this, the rise and rise, this next whatever wave of feminism we're up to now. Um, and I don't mean that in any demeaning way. But at the time, I was very much approaching this as a, as a book about biology. And I very, very quickly realised that if I was going to be writing a book about girls and women or females, and I have, wasn't even really kind of sure of the difference at that point, um, that I was going to have to quickly get up to speed on um, what was happening. What I found was that people started asking me kind of dumb questions, like, what are the differences between the male and the female brain? And I would say that would probably be the question I was asked the most. They said what are you writing a book about, the female brain? People say, what are the differences between the male and the female brain? And people are very much approaching it from this perspective here. So if I read through that, I definitely have a male brain. I don't know about the rest of you. So people were asking me these kinds of questions, which I just found infuriating and frustrating because I wasn't... This isn't a book about the guys and the men and the male brain, but I realised that if I was going to be talking about women, I had to get my definitions right. People also started me asking me much more sophisticated questions about, you know, how different are the differences between the male and the female brain. I'm not going to show you all my kind of uh, statistics looking at the different of the differences, but because there's lots of scientists in the room, if you look at page eight, I don't know, what page of the book, I do actually have some normal distribution curves in the introduction of the book. So... If anyone really wants to dig into the science, how different are the differences, you'll, 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 learn, you'll learn a little bit more there. So I spent an awful lot of time educating myself on things like sex versus gender. I had no idea. I was a bit naive, really. And set off, this is me, searching through the literature, um, trying to understand a little bit more about what's going on. I thought, rather naively, as I said, this was going to be a book about biology and I would just do what I normally do when I go to write kind of a popular science article. I'll look up, anyone know Candell Jessel and Schwartz, The Big Principles of Neuroscience textbook? I'd open that up and I'd read through and then I'd kind of get an overview of a topic and then I'd go to PubMed. I'm sure everyone here in the room knows what PubMed is and I'd look up a review and get an overview of the field, find some key people in the field. Maybe they've written a book or done a TED talk or I'd ring them up and interview them and that was kind of the process I would use. But what I couldn't believe was time and time and time again how often I would go through that process and I would just find no research. I was not expecting that at all. And in fact, one of the greatest surprises about writing the book was where the research was 
there was, there was, where there were huge amounts of research and where there were massive gaps. So I thought I'd just share some of the more entertaining um, findings with you. So I thought, um, you know, who has been on the pill at some point in their lives? Most women in the room probably have dabbled, dabbled in that drug at some point in time. This paper was published in 2014, 50 years of hormonal contraception. Time to find out what it does to our brain. Quite. And as they say, they could only summarise sparse findings. So, couldn't write much about that topic. <laughs> there's a, there, are, there is a little bit in there. There's, there's, there is an extraordinary amount about whether the pill causes depression or not, and we can talk about you know, absolute risk and relative risk and all of those things if you want to get into that stuff later on in the book. But, you know, there were some, there were some surprising gaps. So uh, we don't know much about what the pill does to our brains. Maybe in another 50 years we might figure that one out. When I was deciding the, uh, the order of the chapters in the book, I wrote about kind of, um, you know, childhood and puberty and teenage years and then there's a love, sex, and neurobiology chapter, and then pregnancy. And I was trying to figure out where to put a chapter on anxiety and depression, because I wanted to really write about anxiety and depression, but I didn't want to um, have, it, have it in every chapter, because I didn't want to be this kind of an inevitable part of life as a girl or a woman, you know, whether you're going through puberty or pregnancy or menopause or whatever, you get depressed. So I decided it would have its own standalone chapter. And... I didn't really want to put it between pregnancy and menopause because I thought that would be a bit sad if that's all that there was between like 33 and 50. <laughs> Turns out there is nothing there. Lost the, lost the. This is another review. There's a call to study midlife. As this says, you know, there are societies and journals and research institutes devoted to everything from infancy to old age but not a lot between kind of the ages of 30 and 50. So if anyone's looking for a gap in the research, there's, there's one there. This was one of the more entertaining ones. Um, it, sleep, something we all do every night. If you um, start delving into the literature and you look at sleep studies that were done looking at the differences between biological men and biological women, it turns out that women, according to sleep studies, have very, very good sleep. We fall asleep early, uh, sooner than men. We don't wake up as much at night. We wake up the next morning, according to the sleep studies, doing all right. But if you ask a group of women how well they slept, they say they slept terribly. The men, on the other hand, sleep studies could be appalling. They say, oh, yeah, it's fine. So women report poor sleep quality even when it appears they have good sleep quality. So there's a bit of a paradox. I can't come to any other conclusion that women whinge more than men, and I don't want that. I'm sure that's not the conclusion. But I, again, a, there's huge gaps here in, in, in the research. So it was really interesting once I sort of delved into that. I was looking at that in terms of kind of what happens to sleep during menopause. Um, talk to these to, to Jessica Mong, this researcher here over in the US, and again she said, "Look, we don't really know. It's another big gap in the research." Now, I thought of all all of the studies that have been done, there would be one thing that us women would have, and Adam has given us a little bit of a kind of a a, a, a bit of a prequel to that. I thought we would have the multiple orgasm literature wrapped up because women have got that. Turns out there's a research review on that. I put multiple orgasms into PubMed one day, clicked review, five reviews came up, three of them were looking at the possible of multiple orgas orgasms in men. So three out of the five pieces of research were on men, not on women. I think if you just did this, multiple orgasms in women, what we know so far, despite popular interest, the topic of female multiple orgasms has received surprisingly little scientific assessment. Now, I've given versions of this talk, I haven't given it this year yet, so I'm a bit clunky, but I gave this talk 23 times last year. The 24th time I gave this talk was in Otago University, where I did my undergrad in New Zealand, and um, a young man came up to me after the talk, and he said, oh, I wrote one of those papers that you were talking about. Turns out... <laughs> He was Eric. I didn't even know he was in New Zealand. 
let alone was going to be at my talk. <laughs> so I've been using him as a butt of my jokes all year, and then there he was. And he was very earnest, and he said, but there really is no research on multiple orgasms in men. And he didn't quite get the joke. I was like, there's none on women either. So there's, <laughs> last time I gave this talk, I met Eric, bless. He's very earnest. <laughs> Very upset that there's not enough research on what he what he does. So they, they were kind of where the gaps in the research were. I thought I'll just give you a bit of a insight into where I did find some really interesting pieces of research and um, try and perhaps talk to you about the pieces of research that have surprised people the most when I when I've been talking about the book and some of the shocking things that I have been asked. Um, as I said, time and time again, I've been asked, you know, what are the differences between the male and female brains? And there are a lot of assumptions that come when you start talking about sex, gender, and, and, and neurobiology. Um, one of the, I guess, uh, kind of themes, themes that emerges is the role of hormones in terms of women's emotions. And I thought, well, I'm a neuroscientist. Let's start kind of digging down and getting really granular with this research and start looking at various phases of the menstrual cycle and looking at different measures of, uh, of cognition, so thinking, and various measures of emotion, so how we feel. Well, it turns out when you start getting really granular on all these measures, nothing really seems to show up as being influenced by kind of the ebbs and flows of, of female hormones across the menstrual cycle. And this kind of goes counter to what many, many, many women would say they experience when it comes to PMS. So one of the most surprising findings comes from research out of New Zealand by a, uh, a women's health psychiatrist called Sarah Romans, who's at Otago University in New Zealand. And she became very interested in this idea, how much do hormones actually control our emotions? Are we all riding this hormone, hormonal roller coaster we can't get off? We're kind of beholden to our hormones in a way that men aren't. And she was getting women always coming in and, and, and talking to her about how they were feeling. She just didn't believe that hormones were the, were, were the key. So she designed um, a study, it was called the Mood and Daily Life she didn't design the Mood and Daily Life study, but she conducted a Mood and Daily Life study where she recruited a lot of women. They got given an app, prompted them a couple of times a day to record all kinds of things, their emotional state, um, whether they were feeling socially supported, how stressed they were, their levels of uh, physical health, um, the day of their menstrual cycle, various other measures like that. Now, there were two things she did in the study that were quite unusual. One... When she was asking how well, the woman felt, whether they were feeling happy or sad, she actually gave them positive emotions to choose from as well as negative emotions. Because an awful lot of studies that have been done on P uh, PMS historically have only asked women, are you feeling sad and weepy and grumpy and angry? There was never any options for women to say, well, actually, you know, I feel fine. I feel creative. I feel happy. I feel energetic. I feel upbeat. So she included positive and negative emotions in that scale, which is quite radical, you would think. <laughs> The other thing that she did was she didn't tell the woman the study was on PMS. They just were looking at mood and daily life. So she crunched the data, about three or 400 women over the course of, I don't know, six months. So there were many, many hundreds of menstrual cycles in here. So these are all women of reproductive age who weren't on the pill. Got to the end, crunched all the data. Do you know how many women's emotions varied based on day of the month? Only one in 20, which is extraordinarily different, vastly different from the data that she gets when she tells the woman the study is looking at PMS, which harks back to what a lot of the feminist literature says about, you know, kind of women self-silencing and feeling they can only be cranky at a certain time of the month. What women's emotions varied far more closely to, or women's emotions were far more reliant on, was whether they were feeling socially supported, how their physical health was, and how stressed their lives were. Now, there were still one in 20 women whose emotions were kind of following that kind of monthly cycle, but 19 out of 20 women, if they weren't thinking about PMS, they weren't experiencing it, which I thought was a really, really interesting finding but has perhaps been one of the studies that when I've talked about this book, um, I get women in the room just sitting there going. <laughs> but I do think it is something to think about. You know, we think about what influences how we feel. We construct our emotions based on what we're thinking, what's happening in the outside world. I kind of call it what's happening bottom-up, our bottom-up biology, the outside-in world, and our, and our thoughts 
and our expectations. And our expectations of our health and our expectations of how we feel are incredibly important. I find that actually quite an empowering finding, that, you know, you're not beholden to your hormones, which is actually quite, quite a good thing. I mean, we can go out and do jobs. We can work. We can be employed, even if we have periods. <laughs> Who would have thought? I've just put this picture up here to remind myself of the one question that I have been, I've, only, I've been asked this and two, t- twice, but once was on live radio, commercial radio, it was in the ABC, by an old white gentleman asked me, what goes wrong in the brains of gay people? <laughs> on live radio. So I kind of... <clears throat> There, there is a study I describe in the, in the, in the chapter on sex, love and neurobiology. Um, a, a, a British researcher has done a, a beautiful study where he's done, he's got six straight women, six gay women, six straight men, six gay men, and he's done a series of fMRI studies where they get put in a scanner and it kind of takes like kind of a video of their brains in action while they're looking at a photo of their lover and then some photos of things like, you know, cats and tractors and, I don't know, neutral objects like chairs and um, and it turns out hashtag love is love it doesn't matter whether you're male female straight or gay the way that your brain responds to someone you love is identical and so that was what I tried to explain to the I will, he will remain nameless commercial radio uh, uh, guy who asked me what goes wrong in the brains of gay people because absolutely nothing does. And um, I did uh, write, I was ha- happened to be writing that, ch- that, that book chapter just over a year ago when um, we got that great same-sex marriage bill, marriage equality vote through. So that was quite nice. Another one of the stories that um, I suppose it's a little bit of kind of along the lines of this, this kind of hormonal thing, this PMS thing, and it harks back to one of the very first questions that I was considering when I was writing this book, was this idea about baby brain. So it turns out three out of four women put their hands up and they say, oh yeah, I have baby brain. I turn into this kind of like docile, forgetful person who kind of can't make decisions when I'm pregnant and I'm not entirely sure, well I was never entirely sure whether that finding was quite right. Um, I think of you know, our warm, wise, smart, inspiring Prime Minister and how well she did, because I'm a New Zealander, when she was pregnant. Sorry, Australia. Um, we only need to look at her. She's an N of one example. But it has been really interesting to sort of delve into the, into the literature on this as well. So when women are brought into the research lab... Um, And you can do various kinds of studies. You can look at a whole group of pregnant women and compare them to a whole group of non-pregnant women. You can get one woman and study her before she's pregnant, during her pregnancy, and after her pregnancy, and do the whole battery of cognitive testing. And if she's in the lab, she's doing perfectly fine. There is absolutely no measure that we have seen in any pregnant woman or group of pregnant women compared to non-pregnant women that, that appears to drop in any way. Yet we persist in telling ourselves that we all get baby brain. And again, it may be a little bit like this PMS, where we kind of have this paradox that exists between what we experience and what we're told that we should be feeling. So I've I've had this theme come up quite a few times during the book, and it was kind of cool because it kind of felt like it was a bit of neuroscience supporting that a lot of that feminist theory there. And again, it wasn't what I was expecting. But again, perhaps one of the the great surprises that came out of this book, that, hey, yay, when we're pregnant, we can also kind of do our jobs and, you know, do quite well. Thank you very much. So I talk about that in the book, and that was perhaps, again, one of the surprises, and again, one of those stories that I've had a little bit of pushback from. But if, you know, you want to persist in that belief... I do want to finish off with this, this lady here, and she's become a little bit more dear to me recently because I've um, been doing, I've been filming with an uh, episode of ABC Catalyst lately, and the episode's on longevity. We're looking at the, the various factors that we can do to promote, promote both kind of um, lifespan, how can you live for a really long time, but how can you stay healthy 
within that lifespan. So how can your health span match your lifespan? And I spent a week in San Francisco last week where we went over and met all of these very interesting kind of... Some very interesting Silicon Valley biohackers and who, are, who, who believe that, um, that the fact that humans die is a cultural construct. In fact, two of them said to me, it's just a cultural construct that humans die. And these are like smart, one of them was a computer scientist from Stanford, and I was kind of like, well, I'm not sure whether the data quite supports that. <laughs> but they are doing whatever they can do to live, live, live forever, and there's some really kinds of crazy interesting things that we're doing. But I do think that we can look to some of the people who have lived for a really long time, and I don't know whether anyone knows who this woman is. There's been a bit of backlash against her recently. Some journos came out kind of saying that they don't think it's true. Apparently she's faked it, but I think there's more evidence that it will... Yeah, you, don't, you do think it's true. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, there's a bit of controversy about this lady. Her name is Jeanne Calmont. She may have lived to 124. She looks pretty bloody old, so she lived for a very long time. She's kind of my spirit animal there with her glass of champagne. Um, she does have a very interesting story, regardless of, you know, it, it is debatable how old she was. Um, but she did a pretty good job of faking it, if indeed it was fake. Um, and, and it's really interesting, I guess, from the perspective of looking at the women's brain book or, or, or women's health in general. The reason I was looking at her was because we do, you know, that on average, women live longer than men. But women in those extra years of life don't tend to have as good a health. So men kind of cruise through life and they get really old and then kind of fall off the twig quite quickly. Whereas women, we live a little bit longer, but we don't necessarily have as good a health in those extra years of life. So, you know... It's kind of swings and roundabouts, which way you want to go. We'll see whether the Silicon Valley cultural construct guys come up with something. But anyway, Jean Calmon was apparently, according to records, although some people dispute it, born in 1875, and she died in 1997, within a couple of um, weeks of Princess Diana. So she was maybe 124 years old when she died. So she was born before cinema and before aeroplanes and... She saw the Eiffel Tower being built and met Vincent van Gogh. Whether or not, or that, that's all debatable. What we do know about her life is she lived this incredibly enriched life for someone of her era. So she, she married into a reasonably wealthy family. She was engaged in an awful lot of, you know, she used to like do fencing and go to the opera and climb mountains and ride her bike and was very, very social. So she, she was using her brain, you know, uh, kind of fostering that cognitive reserve, fostering that neuroplasticity throughout her lifespan. We know that she lived in a second floor apartment, so she used to walk up two flights of stairs until she moved into a nursing home when I think she was kind of somewhere around age 110. She used to ride her bike up until that point. The only thing that she did, which is perhaps debatable, was that she smoked. And the story goes that she stopped smoking when she moved into the nursing home because she became too proud to ask the nursing staff to light her fags for her. And she was very, very uh, witty and with it until the very end. Now, she, she, there was an awful lot of attention given to her, but I think regardless of how old she was, a study that was done on her when she was apparently 118 was interesting. A group of neuropsychologists went in and conducted a series of studies on her over the course of about six months. And they went in and visited her every few weeks and they did various tests of verbal reasoning and memory and maths and all these kinds of cognitive tests that scientists do. And what's really cool is if you look at her test scores over the course of the six months of testing is that they improved. So maybe she was 118 when this was done. Maybe she was 89. Maybe she was 95. Who knows how old she was. She was pretty bloody old. But what is really interesting was that her brain did retain that capacity for plasticity and for change. So it's, you don't get to a certain point in life when, you know, all of this kind of plasticity and, you know, things kind of stop. You don't get to midlife and there's this giant gap and nothing happens anymore. You don't get to menopause, women, and nothing happens. You know, whether she was 118 or not is debatable. But her test scores did improve, and I think that's quite compelling evidence. And I think it's quite hopeful for a lot of people. So I, kind of, I, I, I always try to tell that story because people can get a bit depressed because a lot of the other 
stories I tell in the book are kind of a little bit of myth busting, or not myth busting, but people get a bit demoralised. Oh, nothing I thought um, was true is, but I think um, you know we should all have a glass of champagne like Jeanne to celebrate. Now, writing a book. Now I do dance, not very well. <laughs> yeah, you might be able to spot me in there if you look hard. Um, writing a book is really unhealthy. I don't recommend it. You spend an awful lot of time by yourself, sitting down, alone, worrying about what other people think about you. Um, you don't move much. Uh, occasionally you talk to other scientists, and it's all quite... Well, you've done PhDs in the room. You know what happens. It's just kind of unhealthy. And so I got to the end of... Let's put this picture in here. I got to the end of writing my book, and I thought, I've got to kind of take on board what I've learned and I guess what I you know one of the biggest surprises that came out of writing this book was how you know at every phase of life um, and I haven't and I and there's so many things I could have talked about but I'm going to run out of time um, I, I talk a lot about anxiety and depression in the book and I talk a lot about risk I talk a lot about resilience I talk a lot about vulnerability and and so many people um, when they're talking about these kinds of life transitions you go through, whether it be old age, whether it be menopause, whether it be pregnancy, whether it be you know the teenage years and all the vulnerabilities of adolescence, whether it be entering puberty, whether it be early childhood, um, especially when we're thinking about male brains and female brains, we always tend to default to the biological, and especially in girls and women, blame our hormones for when things go wrong. But the PMS study, the pregnancy study... I think it does show that there are an awful lot of things that influence the brain, kind of as Adam said, you know, there's our bottom-up biology, but there's the outside and influence of the world around us, and there's our, these top-down thoughts and expectations. One of the most striking findings that came out of the book was all the researchers I spoke to, and I was talking about every point in the lifespan, I was like, well, you know, what can we do to support someone going through pregnancy? Or support a woman going through menopause? Or support someone, you know, a young person going through adolescence, or someone who's struggling with puberty? Um, and there's so many stories I wish I could have told about each of those. Um, and, and every single researcher said to me, and every single doctor and every single expert said, oh, well, it's about the people. It's about building social structures around people. It's about supporting your kids. It's about love and connection. Um, Richie Poulton, the head of the Dunedin study in New Zealand, said sometimes it's about the love of one other person. Um, it's not necessarily about having hundreds of connections, but it's about the people with you. And, you know, you think about every kind of point in your life, um, you know, your story is never a story of kind of you or me, it's a story of we, and it's a story of all of the other people that are kind of intertwined in your life. And so I got to the end of writing this book and I was miserable. Loved writing the book, but it's lonely. And I thought, I've got to do something that's opposite of writing a book. So I joined the local amateur dramatics theatre group. And I went along to the audition. I said, I can't sing and I can't dance, but I just kind of want to be involved. And so they gave me the job opening and closing the curtains. <laughs> So I was very lucky, but they also let me join in one of the ensembles. <laughs> but I just mouthed the words. Um, <laughs> so, but I did dance. So I do do a little bit of dance. This was, it was a Eurovision spoof. Um, oh, and I also got to be um, the, the Russian door bitch at the beginning and tell everyone how to use the voting app. So I had some very important jobs. But I guess that's just a bit of a reminder that... Um, there's so many stories I wish I could tell. When you approach my book, please don't think it's just this kind of boring book about biology and hormones, because it's really not. Um, and, you know, I approached it with this kind of quite... as, as quite a naive scientist, I guess, thinking that it was going to be a book about that. Um, and, and not kind of applying my knowledge, knowing that everything that shapes the brain is everything that happens in our lives, and in particular the people that we meet... And, and interact with, and so that was kind of what, what happened to me after. And um, interestingly, that's what kind of got me my Catalyst job, because when I auditioned for Catalyst, they asked me what I've done for my brain lately, that they could come and film. <laughs> <laughs> so I was opening and closing the curtains really well. Anyway, I know there's time to pick my brain later on. I've got so many stories I would love to have shared from the book, and it's a shame I haven't got more time, but I'm happy to answer any questions about point in the female lifespan and um and I'm flogging the book as well if you want to come by too thanks <laughs>
Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and it was, it's really nice to um, start off with this micro kind of what's happening in the brain physiology stuff and move to the cultural context within, we, within which our brain and, and we exist as humans. I love that. And yes, I've got tons of questions. Um, and I, I think as a scientist, I love that Adam, both Adam and Sarah have approached their own disciplines and, and sort of everything else that's associated with the brain, with the scepticism and, and understanding that we know so little about this complex phenomena. Um, and the gaps in the research, that's just a killer. Yeah. And there's so many questions to ask, so many questions. In the second hour of Science in the Club, we want so many questions, so many questions. So please keep questions in your mind. We are going to take a short break. Could you please join me in thanking Adam and Sarah again? In a few minutes' time, we'll start trivia. So we're going to hand out the trivia sheets and some pens, grab some friends next to you, be social, get dancing, form a trivia team. And uh, James O'Hanlon is going to kick off trivia probably in about five minutes. Get ready, people. Why goth boots? <laughs> What's the signal there? Is it a height thing? Is oh, it yeah, a... I have no idea why I'm attracted to that, but... Um, <laughs> All of my girlfriends and both of my wives have always worn big boots like that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right. I don't uh, know why. Sarah no. I, who knows where attraction comes from, why you're attracted to a certain individual. I don't know. Sarah, no guilty confessions, neck mm. tattoos, uh, facial scars, nothing. My husband's an economist. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not talk about that. Let's move on. Specialises in tax. <laughs> 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 it's the pocket protectors, isn't it? <laughs> we had a question over here. <laughs> My question is not about women or sex or neurology, but I, I wonder about the rat, Adam, yes. in your experiment and how you decide that a sand pit and a ball pit is what it likes to play with. Okay, so, yeah, we, we did do this... Properly, so the rat is just a small person. Okay, it has exactly the same brain as we do. Okay, so all the neurological pathways, all the neurochemistry is exactly the same in our brain, but we matched it to the sensory system that dominates the rat, which is called their vibrace. So they go around exploring their world with their whiskers. And if you look at a rat in slow motion, their whiskers are always going like this. They visualise the world, they explore the world through that system it dominates. So we try to put as much stimulation through their vibrace system in that to try and bring in as much sensory integration into that therapy as we could. If you were using a different species, say humans, if you we went to humans, we'd look at different sensory systems and way to stimulate them. So that's why we chose those particular items for the sensory integration. All right, any other questions? There's one over here. With the plasticity of the brain, do you subscribe to the um, public message out there that if you have gratitude and you think positive thoughts, then your brain will respond to that and you'll be a happier person than if you have a lot of negative self-talk all the time? Yeah, I, I think, well, I'm not entirely sure whether we know what's happening from a neural level, but emotions, as far as the latest research around emotions goes, is it's like any other kind of um, skill. Your brain learns how to behave or how to think or how to feel by, by repetition. So if you practice um, looking for the positive... <laughs> Um, not ignoring the negative, then you are far more likely to experience that. And if, you know, I talk about, like, if you know, you kind of wallow in the positive emotions and learn to appreciate them, um, then you're more likely to experience them in the future and almost kind of seek them out. Now, what happens, like, you know, in terms of neural circuits, I don't really think that we, we, we know about that, but 
Um, I do think emotions can be like any other skill that we can learn and we can practice and we can kind of seek out. And this idea of, I mean, rumination is really just kind of a negative thought pattern that kind of goes round and round and round. And we know we've got tons of evidence about rumination sort of spiralling people down into, you know, depression. And, and one way that we can sort of spiral people back up again is by, you know, challenging those thoughts, challenging those emotions, you know, looking for the good, right? you know, writing all of those experiences down that can spiral people back up. So I think, you know, you can, it's very easy to kind of dismiss something like practicing gratitude and hashtag blessed and all those kinds of things, is, but new agey. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you know, what did your nan say? Like, count your blessings. I do think if we practice the positive emotions actively seek them out, then you are more likely to experience them again. Yeah, look out. Our emotional systems are incredibly complex and we, we do know very little about them, but obviously as human beings, they dominate us. It's, I mean, as a neuroscientist, I know uh, quite a bit about how the brain works, but it hasn't helped me at all as an individual. <laughs> you know, I am still dominated by emotions and still dominated by my negative thoughts on a daily basis, as we all are. So th this is part of the, the human brain and how we deal with those negative thoughts. I don't know how many you have a day, but it's thousands and thousands and thousands of this self-talk. Sometimes it's positive, a lot of times it's negative. Uh, where they come from and what we do with them is um, has a lot to do with how we're going to get on, really. So listen to those negative talks, put them in a box, understand them, stay present in the moment and have gratitude for what you've got, I guess, in the end, because these thoughts are going to continue to happen. Well, that's the way I try and deal with it anyway. Well, but so we, we, don't, we don't understand, really. Sarah, this almost links back to your point about the PMS studies, where if they're aware that that's what the study was about, they're reporting greater variation in moods. Yeah, ex our expectations are incredibly important in, in terms of what we experience. Um, and... I mean, we, I mean, the PMS study is a, is a perfect example of that. If we expect that we're going to feel like crap at a certain time of the month, and women will blame our hormones, we expect to feel crappy this next week. Um, and so we do feel crappy. And then we go, oh, it was our hormones, I can't do anything about it, it's inevitable, I will just feel that way. I mean, maybe you pissed off because your husband didn't put the bins out. You know, there could be lots of reasons for that, which, you know, you could have a whole lot more control over. So I don't think that hormo uh, hormones, I don't think that emotions are something that as humans we have no control over and just happen to us. I think we can learn to step back from them. I mean, that's what cognitive behavioural therapy is and that's what psychologists would teach you how to do or therapists would teach you how to do would be to stand back, examine them. And that's why writing them down is a really, really good tool in terms of understanding your emotions. There's lots of evidence in psychology of writing down how you feel, journaling, whatever you want to call it, um, allows you to kind of stand back from them a bit and examine them and, and we're not like beholden to them. So what you're saying is, as a male, next time I'm confronted by a moody female, I can just tell them they're imagining things. Is, is <laughs> good luck. You could, that could be, that's a good experiment to try. <laughs> See how you that could, goes. You report back to us on how that goes. All right. <laughs> seems, seems foolproof to me. Mm. <laughs> Anyone else? Suze. I'm, I'm just intrigued. A lot of people in this room will know my story. I've had a traumatic brain injury. Um, and I'm intrigued by the research and the development of brain, brain plasticity and the way the brain can um, respond and take over different parts of the brain that has been injured. Have you had or done any research that's delved into this brain plasticity where it has taken over different parts of the brain to uh, where the brain has sort of filled in for areas where there's injury and, yeah. Do you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, personally, I haven't done uh, traumatic brain injury research, but it is a very fascinating field with plasticity. And there seems to be quite a little, or quite a lot of difference in uh, which areas of the brain have been damaged and how much recovery that there is. It is a long, slow process, um, the recovery. Um, there are, when the brain is damaged and dies, it is not coming back. Okay, so that bit of the brain is damaged and gone. 
So it does take some time for the rest of the brain to then adapt um, to the new stimuli. So new stimuli needs to come in and trigger the plasticity. And it is highly dependent on which areas of the brain have been damaged and how much recovery um, that you can get. It's, it's not always a, a positive story. So you know, why is it that nerve cells can't repair like other cells can? Because they need to remember shit. <laughs> all right. If they were if they were always being replaced, they wouldn't remember anything. <laughs> is it so? It's the individual cells that have the memories, or yes, the... it is. It's a cellular thing, intracellular. It's the synapses. It's the connections and the networks and the pathways. If they were being replaced all the time, they would go. Well, we know that neurons themselves have probably got the capacity to regrow and regenerate because they're doing the peripheral nervous system but they don't in the central nervous system, oh. so the brain and the spinal cord, so peripheral neurons can and do um, regenerate. But now, I don't know whether a dead neuron could, well, a dead neuron's not going to come back to life, but a cut neuron perhaps could grow a new connection. Um, that doesn't happen in the central nervous system, and one of the reasons why it doesn't isn't because of the neurons themselves, it's because of all of the other cells around, like the glia, the supporting cells, and so perhaps the capacity is there, but it's that sur sort of surrounding environment within the brain and the spinal cord, which means it can't regrow. So that's why you could cut a nerve in your finger and you'd eventually get feeling back in your finger, but if you cut your spinal cord, it won't because of that scar tissue and that environment in which it's in. So as far, I mean, I worked in spinal cord injury quite a while ago. I don't know where the research currently is, but a lot of it is focused not on so much on trying to get the neurons to grow, because if they're still alive, they could. It's looking at the environment in which they are regrowing and the support cells around them. Um, but, I mean, the thing is our human brains are so complex that, you know, they go through development and then they do almost have to kind of consolidate yeah. and become like kind of an information processing machine, not one that's continually being changed by the world around it. It does need to kind of become an adult brain and process the world, not be still learning from the world and growing uh, and changing all the time. And so that's, about yeah. 25,000 yards a day? I don't know those numbers. But, I mean, we, I mean, there's stuff done in, like, and, and, and animals, like, you know, you look at, the, I mean, I remember the experiments being done in ferrets where you could reroute the, say, the, the, the optic nerve to the auditory cortex, so the nerve from the eye going to the part of the brain that would normally hear and that part of the brain that would normally hear would start being able to pick up visual signals and vice versa. So those experiments were done a very, very long time ago. So certainly the brain does have capacity to be able to change its function in different areas, take over others, but it's a really long, difficult process and like you, know, you were saying, it depends on which part of the yeah, brain. Some, some, some parts of the brain retain more plasticity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and if they're, they're so specialised they can't change, especially parts that de sort of develop very early in development, whereas parts that develop much later kind of can retain a bit more plasticity to change. I mean, I guess the only thing you can ever say with certainty about brain injury is it's uncertain, <laughs> which is a horrible thing to say, especially to someone with a brain injury, but I'm sure you probably know that anyway. I, I kind of feel like I've really just got to develop the really good grooves in my brain and, and yeah, I can't go have side offshoots. I've, I've really got to just do things, yeah. If that makes sense. You've just it, you're talking things. about like finding a workaround. Yeah. Like, you know, instead of... The, yeah, and, and that's... And those grooves is just yeah. get, develop the good grooves and just develop them yeah. deeper and deeper. Yeah. And, yeah. and you'll find actual everyday real life workarounds to do things that you couldn't perhaps do before and then your brain... That's a bit of a metaphor for exactly what's happening in your brain. There'll be parts of your brain which will be taking over the jobs of others, but they're not going to do it automatically. They'll mm. do it because you've kind of trained Teacher. it over and yeah, over yeah, and yeah. over and over. Yeah. So it's, it's like learn, learning, learn. but so much harder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, look, um, the everyday functions exhaust a person with brain injury more so, but, hey, there's, it's a whole second chance at life, and it's a pretty... Fortunate one that way too. Yeah. But on that, is what is the key to brain health? Is it diet and exercise, Sudoku? What's the? Um, 
I could quote from what I said in Catalyst yesterday. <laughs> Please do. We do well in terms of well, and it's all about. There's no, nothing different between your brain and your body, yeah. really, because your brain's just part of your body. Diet, exercise, sleep, completely underestimated. Uh, I think it's probably actually number one, but it's just because it's my favourite. So good night's sleep, diet. You can go without. You can't go without a night's sleep, but you can eat crap and never exercise and be fine. You don't have one night's sleep, you feel terrible. So sleep, diet, exercise, all those things that you know, learning new things. I think the other underestimated thing, and I talked about it a bit in my talk, is social connection and the importance of other people. We, we are not like these kind of isolated beings. Our brains are social, and one reason why... You know, one of the, the most complicated things our brain can do and therefore one of the best ways we can keep it fit and healthy is to interact with other people because trying to understand what other people are thinking and feeling is a really complex activity. Um, so interacting with others, social support, it reduces stress. Um, all of those things that you hear about any, for any aspect of your health is going to be relevant, relevant to your brain. It's not separate from the rest of you. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree. Keep challenging it. It's the key. New things. Okay. Learn a language. New. Language Learn is a good. Learn how to ride a unicycle. All that stuff. Language is a good. Instruments are good. Writing with your other hand is good. Doing a crossword and being able to get it out doesn't do anything. You got <laughs> a crossword that you can't get out is good. Right. Okay. Good. Because you've got to look something up. You've got to learn something. Yeah. So. Don't do online brain training. No, don't do online brain training. That's full of shit. That is rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> that really is. So, yeah. Very, the very last thing that anyone that's still gainfully employed should do is go home and do online brain training. It's the last thing you should go outside for a run. Yes. Not stare at your computer for more time. What do you do to get good at is that? Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, All right. A question over here. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, so talking about plasticity, oh, plasticity memory, mostly memory, um, and harking back to Oliver Sacks, I, I know this person was talked about in either Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat or Music Affiliate or one of those. Um, there was this man who couldn't, he didn't have any memory at all. He, he, his wife would leave the room and then when she came back, he'd greet her as if he hadn't seen her for 10 years at a time or something. But then he could stand up and conduct an orchestra with no problems. What's happening there? <laughs> what is that? No, yeah. To me, that's yeah. memory. And I feel There's lots like of different... Sorry. Yeah, no, no, go yeah, ahead. So there's lots of different types of memories. Okay, there's episodic, which is what he's lost. And that's dominated by a brain area called the hippocampus. Okay, whenever we learn something new, a new episode and things like that, it's the hippocampus. But then we have motor learning, okay, which is how to conduct an orchestra. That's in a completely different part of the brain. That's in the cerebellum. So that's why there's this huge difference there between the types of memories. And so different brain areas are controlling those different memories. Is that a similar thing to, say, when, um, you know, your grandparents get Alzheimer's and can yeah. remember things from when they were children? Exactly. So, again, what a week Alzheimer's ago. disease very early on affects the hippocampus again. So what did you have for lunch yesterday? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Probably crackers. Have, have a crack. Crackers and <laughs> you don't remember what you had for lunch yesterday? What about dinner yesterday? I mean, it's been a long time. What about oh, last yeah. night's dinner? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you have for dinner last night? <laughs> well, who can remember what they have for dinner? Who can remember what they had for dinner last night? Maccas. I cooked up a what was left in the pantry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> What about it was a month ago? On a bagel. Okay. <laughs> Cream cheese. <laughs> it was a late night. What did you have for dinner on the twenty first of January? I don't know. Exactly. So that's what the hippocampus is doing. It holds things in memory for about twenty four hours. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it it holds it there and then it decides what's important to store as a long term memory. And that gets stored up in the cortex. And that usually happens during sleep, which is another reason why sleep is a really important thing, is the consolidation of memories. If the 21st of January was your birthday or a hot date or something like that, you would remember what you had for dinner on the 21st of January because it was important. And the hippocampus would take in all of that information that came in about how you, all your emotions and all the sensory input and put it as a package and then while you slept it would go, I need to remember that, I'm going to go and store it somewhere. Which is why in early Alzheimer's disease it's all about not being able to learn new things and things like that. 
then it deteriorates and heads up into the cortex and stuff where the long-term memories are stored and then unfortunately they start to go as well later on in the disease. Horrible disease. So that explains why Jason Bourne was such a wicked martial artist, even though he didn't know he was. Yeah. It's complete, just science. Completely different parts of the brain. Right. Motor learning and episodic learning. And uh, the Jackie Chan movie, Who Am I? Or yeah, he was old Jackie Chan but didn't know his own name. It's a good one. Check it out. I think we have time for one last quick question. <laughs> oh, that's a shame because I had two. <laughs> two and a half questions. Go. All right, now we're connected. So first of all, I'm a bit intrigued about memory and how it's actually stored, like physically in the brain. Like a computer, it's like a physical state somewhere in a little chip, whatever. But how's that happening in the brain? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, no fucking idea. <laughs> okay. That was quick. We, we do have, we're working on it. So I, I've done some work in memory. Um, so what we do know is that for a memory to form, uh, we need a neurotransmitter released called glutamate. And we do know that that needs to interact with a receptor called the N-methyl-D aspartate receptor. Okay, and then we get, that gets highly triggered. Okay, then sodium will come in, but also this really other fabulous chemical called calcium. Okay, so calcium will come in to the cell and then that will trigger changes in the DNA and it will start to make new proteins and start to, say, make more receptors. And that's where we're seeing the physical changes now at the level of the synapse. And we think that has a lot to do with the storage of a new memory. So the, it's plasticity, really, is what memories are. Um, but it's not just there, the, the, it's networks of connections as well. So, you know, when you're, you're having these random thoughts and you think about something and that triggers the next thought and that triggers the next memory and you sort of jump around in these different networks. There's other theories about oscillating signals in different areas of the brain, laying them down in the different networks. So a lot of work to be done, but, you know, we know a few little things. So I know if I block the NMDA receptor, then I can block a memory from forming and things like that, or block the intracellular signaling. Right. Yeah, memories are complex, and then retrieval. You know, <laughs> well, that was the second question yeah, actually. So, uh, yeah, don't know. We don't know. Well, I'm sure if you want to hang around and ask these guys another question, you can. There's still a chance to grab a book before we head out, but we should probably wrap things up. Because it's Valentine's Day and we need to let people get home to do whatever it is they do. Guys, thank you very much for coming. Thanks to the Wicklow for having us. Thanks to the New England Northwest Regional Science Hub and Inspiring Australia for making everything happening. Thanks to Kirsty. Give a round of applause once more time for Sarah and Adam. <laughs> and keep in mind, in May, the 20th to the 22nd. We're doing a three-day festival like this for Pine of Science. It's actually going to be at the Armadale Golf Club. Who knew Armadale had a golf club? My goodness. I'll see you there in May for Pine of Science. Anything I've forgotten, Kirsty? All right. Good night. Thanks again.